Memphis and Nashville are 200 miles apart in a straight line, and they're at opposite ends of the universe musically. Long distance information, give me Memphis, Tennessee. Help me find the party, try to get in touch with me. She could not leave her number, but I know who placed the call. Cause my uncle took the message. It was Beale Street and the blues that made you see, uh, the music from the Delta is, to me, is the foundation of all of it. The black gospel and the blues gravitated to the city of Memphis and then moved North Chicago, but whatever we had that was white country shipped it to Nashville. Don't you think, baby, we could find us a brand new recipe? Like one would say, well, let's don't go there and record, because they don't know nothing about country music. It's all rhythm and blues. And then they would say the same, the same thing in, in Memphis, let's don't go to Nashville, because they don't know anything about rhythm and blues. Just, they're just old, that old country. But now today, we're, we're kind of looking at each other and, and, and liking each other's uh, things because we're so close. What I would like to see happen ultimately with this record is that somehow without dotting the I and putting the, the token pedal steel guitar in there, so, well, that's country, and geez, those kunga drums are R&B, I would like it 
I'd like it to be seamless. I'd like to stay true to the song. Good old Moses, there's nothing that you can say. Robot Pop Staples goes back to the days of the Delta Blues. He knew and worked with people like Charlie Patton, Robert Johnson, Robert Jr. Lockwood, and many others. So uh, I started playing when I was a boy. Played down there, played a few blues in Mississippi. When we get through picking cotton, we set out on a big porch and sang. Take a love, Marty Stewart is probably the purest of the current traditional country performers, and he has always maintained that type of straight country, rural mountain music approach. Pops and I are both from Mississippi, so we got to work this thing out together. But uh, we probably had some of the same influences, you know, in our uh, formative days musically. And we were all raised in the church house. And I think I hear all kind of influences in the way that I, musically, I hear you know, a bit of gospel in this, you know. God made man and he made him out of clay, put him on earth, but not to stay. Fear all along, we got found dead. Oh, baby, don't we? Well, I think the Mississippi Delta was just as, as fertile to American culture as the Delta was in ancient Egypt. It was where black people, heard the white man's music and made something new out of it. It was where uh, the white man heard the black man's music. And, uh, you know, people say the blues came from Africa. Well, I think they, they really came from the deep south. Man, I thank God that they invented guitars to get people like you and me out of cotton fields. <laughs> We've just been in the way down there, man. I always felt that country music was just white soul music and that essentially thematically you're dealing with the same material and even musically you're on this core that's that's based pretty much from you know comes from the blues really rhythm and blues was one of the hybrid forms that emerged out of the jazz revolution of the mid and late 40s and people like Charlie Parker Dizzy Gillespie and many others began making harmonic and melodic changes in the music. Some of the other musicians who had gotten their apprenticeship in swing bands, rather than adapt and change to the bebop form, they took what they'd always done, the swing and the jump, and they simply merged swing and jump with gospel-based vocals, and that's really where rhythm and blues comes from. I get two kicks on route through St. Louis, Joplin, Missouri, and Oklahoma City, and a mighty pretty city. Since I fell for you, oh yeah, yeah. Since I fell for you, great song, man. Now, you call, see, that's the difference. We called them, the black folk called them torches. White folk call them pop. Always that difference in there. I had no trouble getting into this at all. I thought I would because, like I said, the song has been done 9,000 times by, you know, by everybody. There's just a big difference in the way that music sounded and the way the music sounds today. There was something about the melodies. There was something about the words that made it all just work. And you never forgot those melodies. So, and yeah, yeah, I know I can't get you out of my heart.
You took my love and now you're gone, 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 gone. Since I fell for you. Bring such me as sorry and pain. I guess I'll never, oh, I guess I'll never be the same since I fell for you. I gotta say this right here. Well, well, it's too bad. Every now and then, I would watch the country music awards, you know, when no one was looking. <laughs> and uh, um, I saw her, I saw her singing, and I don't know, just something about her. I think the blues and country music are very close. I've always said that if you can get the emotion, the deep down gutsy feeling of R&B, and the tr the very um, relatable lyrics from country, you've got a monster song. It's too bad and it's too sad. Oh, and it's and too sad. I'm still in love with you. country music. I'm religiously in love with it, and I always have been. But the honky tonks and lonely songs I left behind when I left you. It's just uh, real close to country music, and I love rhythm and blues, and this is the reason I've always loved B.B. King. No one man ever enters her mind. She loves to flirt with maybe eight or nine. She loves to go out and have a ball. B.B. King. I sort of like raised that boy, you know. Uh, he came to Memphis from a little town down in Mississippi called Indianola. I lived in the Delta, and there was no music stores or anything near us, so we had to order things by uh, mail order. And the first songs I learned about the musical notation was My Darling Clementine. Oh, you are my sunshine. The governor of Louisiana, Jimmy right. Davis. Jimmy. So in the Delta, we call country music the white man's blues, and ours was the other blues. And uh, so we both crossed over and sang some of all. Two days later, Papa passed away. I became a man that day. Every day I had to work the fields, cause that's the only I was the oldest of the family, and everybody was depending on me. Now years have passed, and everybody 
has grown. Mama's been living in a brand new home. Lord knows it took a lot of sweat and tears, and my daddy's voice to help us through the years. He said, that years, I'm It's American music. That's what we call American music. Something that you can relate to. Something that happens every day in, in people's lives. You think because if a white man comes home in the morning and he be living with his wife and for 25 years and got four children and he comes home from work in the evening and when he gets there and opens up that door, there's no furniture in the house, nothing, bare walls. Even the linoleum up off the floor salt out of the shakers and just because he's white you think he ain't got the blues and that's what rhythm and blues is, the stories are about uh, like patches and uh and that's what country music is about patches i'm depending on your son to pull the family through my son Memphis celebrates the individual, and uh, there has never been a major record company affiliation in Memphis to survive. Nashville became a, a music center relatively late, and really as a result of a, a series of historical uh, accidents. Certainly one of the most important factors was that the Grand Ole Opry was in Nashville. Speaking of uh, Grand Ole Opry, why, everybody expects some picking and singing. Well, that's what we're going to do for you here tonight. So we'll start off with a little bit of hillbilly fever. Yeah! So the Opry gradually gathered in the finest talent uh, in country music. And it became natural for uh, people to begin to record here in Nashville if they wanted to work with that talent. Hey, good looking. What you got cooking? The really ironic thing is the first Patsy Cline song I ever remember hearing was I Fall to Pieces because um, <laughs> my, my parents had one of those, uh, you know, great country hits of the Stars albums you could probably buy off the television. And I fall to pieces. And, uh, so we recorded I Fall to Pieces and put it out <clears throat> and it became a hit. Eventually, it took a long time. It was like several, eight, eight, maybe eight months, because we tried so hard to get a hit. And uh, she said, "You know, I never did like that song." I think it's really dangerous to try to recapture Patsy's moment. I, this, you know, we've we've been dealing with some. That's one of the real challenges of this record. And and it's incumbent upon me, after leaving the studio, not to try to. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, destroy that moment or, or obscure the, the essence of what was happening. The, the reason we have so many musicians playing live is to try to really walk out of here with as close to finished record as we can. Each time I see you again Aaron Neville, in his own way, I believe, is what uh, Jerry Lee Lewis likes to call a stylist, someone so, like Al Jolson, Jimmy Rogers, Hank Williams. How can I be just your friend? You want me to act like we never Forget, pretend we never met. And I've tried, and I've tried, but I haven't yet. You walk by, and I fall to pieces. people try to stereotype country music as they think we're all hillbillies. I think we're proving right now uh, that, that country music is more than, than just singing through your nose <laughs> and, and, and being uh, unaware about all kinds of other kinds of music. Rhythm and blues was a black music first and foremost. It was designed, structured, conceived, and geared for black audiences. At the same time, though, you had the phenomenon from the late 40s and into the early 50s and prior to the emergence of rock and roll, in which more and more white youngsters began to hear it and were attracted to it. Politically, of course, people who were opposed to it immediately realized that if whites began to listen to the music and begin to view the people who made the music as no different than they are, well then, that was obviously going to lead to them questioning the kinds of laws that kept them apart. Bye 
Little Richard uh, is an amazing character. It was a degree of, of mania that he injected into the music. Forget about uh, R&B, rock and roll. Kind of, he just uh, definitions really have no have no bearing. You know, she's more than a country singer to me, and country music is one of my favorite music. I'm from Georgia, and I've always loved country music. Bill Monroe and Hank Williams, all yeah. those people from way, way back, because it's the truth. They sing the truth. And, and when I heard this girl, I said, this girl can sing. She is a rock and roll singer. <laughs> Shut up. She comes, here comes that girl again. Won't entertain us since I don't know when. But she don't notice me when I pass. She go with all the guys from out of my class. And that keeps stopping me from thinking to myself. Oh, she good looking, man. She's something else. Hey, look at that. Across the street. Fine looking man. Wow, it's something else. Hey, look at here. Just wait and see. solve it. I've been a fan of his for probably 25, 30 years. Well, in New Orleans, we say there's God and there's Chet Atkins. And uh, now with this project, we're recording some together, black music and white music. and. It's been coming closer together, really, ever since Elvis. For me personally, you know, growing up, uh, you know, get, cutting my musical fandom in the 50s, uh, you know, early rock and roll was essentially you know, country music, you know, rockabilly, and, 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 and R&B. So that, that's what it was. That, that's what uh, the, those, those of us kids in the 50s were, were listening to. So in the mid-50s, you have Elvis here in the center, sort of representing uh, the advent of rock and roll. Though rock and roll really had preceded him by a dozen or so years, in the popular mind, he was the avatar of rock and roll. Elvis's impact on black music was like nothing else, because it really gave black music an injection that it hadn't had before. A white boy doing it now. That makes it good. <laughs> and that's what Sam Phillips was looking for. He was looking for a white boy that could sing in a black manner and attract all the kids, and um, he was right. Chet Atkins put that rough edge into Elvis's first RCA recordings. Southern sky. The storyline is a culmination of uh, my early childhood. 
it was such a wonderful feeling of uh, being surrounded by everything that was important in life. And it goes rushing through your soul like the stories told of old, old man. They'd sit on the porches late at night because there wasn't a lot of electric lights around and they'd tell these stories and the wind would blow and blow through the trees and the moon was out and then a big gush of wind would come and blow right through your soul, seemed like. Chet Atkins was a major player in the development of Nashville as a, as a recording center. He was the guy who really went into the studio and had a major role in how country records sounded uh, from the late 1950s through the middle 1970s. Rockabilly sprang out of Memphis in the middle 1950s and horrified country because it really pulled uh, fans away from the traditional country artists. Conway was really somebody who came out of uh, uh, out of the burst of energy of rock and roll and rockabilly, and then landed as a as a country singer. Hovering by my suitcase, trying to find a warm place to spend the night. Drops falling Seems I hear your voice calling It's all right It's a rainy night in Georgia A rainy night in Georgia Lord, I believe it's raining on Anytime you hear a Conway Twitty song, you always hear a lot. Certainly hear country. But you always hear a little gospel, both black and white and blue. Neon signs are flashing. Taxi cabs and buses passing through the night. A distant moan of a train seemed to play a sad refrain to the night. A rainy night in Georgia A rainy night in Georgia If you play back some of the old material of Sam and Dave, you'll hear a whole heap of country in there. You'll hear, even with Soul Man, you hear the opening line. It's country. If you would take the horns away from the Sam and Dave material, you would hear all country. Because this is where we basically started. I'm a soul man. I'm a soul man. I'm a soul man. Soul music goes with country music. There's, there's just, there's just a, if there's a line at all, there's a tiny one. I kind of like it when it rains like that. You like that? Bring back some memories from a long it does. time ago. It does. Remember how the rain used to sound? It just makes you want to, you know, 
know sometimes you sit back and go la, da, la, da, 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 da. Yeah, it makes me want to, but I can't, Sam. Oh, you can I do can it. Do try, try, try. But I can tell you this. I what? remember how that rain used to sound on that tin roof back then. Yeah, on. do that deep thing I like to hear you say. That's it. That's the one right there. Uh, <laughs> oh, Brooke Benton, where are you, son? Out in the rain, in the rain, in the rain. Sam, I think I'm getting wet. Something's Wrong With My Baby. That's one of my favorite all-time rhythm and blues soul ballads written by uh, Isaac Hayes and David Porter. We chose the Travis Tritt Patty LaBelle song like just the other day, and uh, turns out Patty's got a lot of preparation. We, Travis wanted to do uh, Sam and Dave's When Something's Wrong With My Baby. Turns out Dave was Patty's cousin, and so, she, so she's done a lifetime of preparation for it. Sam and Dave, Stax Records, huh? Back in about, what, 1966 or 7? I'm not sure. You remember the year? I don't remember the year. Nor the month, <laughs> nor the day. I can tell you approximately what happened. It happened a lot the same way every day. We'd all get to the studio about 11 o'clock, and David would be showing Sam and Dave the lyric and how it went with the song. And, Andy and, and I getting would show up singing it to them in front of them and everything. heard black and white during that whole tenure with Stax. All I heard was music and people putting that stuff together. And this was all being done in a time in which segregation was still the law of the land and these people could actually be arrested. They'd leave the studio and they couldn't go out and get a meal together. And we didn't think much about that. That was before inter you know, integration. We were driving through Mississippi and Alabama to get to Muscle Shoals. And we stopped a lot of times at a little Dairy Queen in Mississippi, about halfway, to get food. And the first time we stopped there, they still had a colored window on the side and a white window in the front. My dilemma was whether to get out and go with the black guys through the side window and piss off the rednecks, <laughs> or go with the white window in the front and piss off my pals. <laughs> so I just stay in the car, give Andrew $5, and say, bring me a cheeseburger to shake. <laughs> When something is wrong with my baby. You know, I think of Travis as being a guy with one foot in a southern rock band and one foot in country music. Just when you try to think that I'm in this little category and you put me in this little box, I'm gonna jump right over out. here. <laughs> I'm over here. I'm not gonna I'm mm -hmm. not gonna stay there. Because that's you know, it's not part of, of of what I am. I'm, I'm a mixture of every different kind of music that I grew up listening to. I'm a product of my influences.
just what he means to me now. Oh, you people, you just don't have a clue, babe. Or you don't understand. Well, people say. Say that she's just no good She's my woman Oh, and I know I'm her man I think that uh, traditionally speaking, uh, in the in the history of R&B, there's been more crossover than from country. If, if you see what I mean, I mean uh, one of the standard things to do in the '60s or early '70s with an R&B artist was to cut a country song. This, uh, I guess, was started by Ray Charles. Hey, good looking. What you got cooking? How about cooking something up with me? What we're really looking for are songs that are incredible songs that that could be done by either a country artist or an R&B artist, but, but that are larger than either, you know, faction, if you will. This is our green. <laughs> how you, how you doing? Oh, doing fine. been so long now, and it seems like it was only yesterday. Ain't it funny how time slips away? Hey, 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 yeah. All right, now. <laughs> Ain't it funny? Still did it wrong. Ain't it? Ain't it? Yeah, yeah, see, Lyle is singing uh, my note. Uh -oh. he, he don't seem to want to sing his note. Wait, like show me my note again. Ain't it funny? Ain't it funny? Yeah. Funny how time slips away. Yeah. 
It should be good. Mm -hmm. yeah, the okay. song itself. Mm. You know, is that country and western song? Gee, ain't it funny? How time just slips away. I got I got to sing "Funny How Time Slips Away" for uh, Willie Nelson's birthday party uh, a while back, and mm. the the idea of being able to sort of um, marry these. Two, mm -hmm. two versions of the song was really exciting to me. And it's funny how time slips The soul era, I think, was the final fruition for what I consider to be the greatest form of vocal music, which is gospel, being adapted wholly into the popular sector. So are you still doing church on Sundays? Oh, yeah, occasionally, every Sunday. I mean. You gotta come. Bring your wife and you come and enjoy it, man. All great music does reflect the the era in which it, it, it comes, but I think the truly timeless music, I think we'll always have something to say. Chain, chain, chain. Today, but now that he's on the phone, <laughs> uh, but the, uh, I know, this is the phone. A, this is a. Uh, this is. Are a, you uh, listening to the track? <laughs> yes, you can hear the track. Yes. man, that's <laughs> great. This Clint, 
Clint Black is a very interesting performer because he's a, he's a, a real honky tonk country singer, and I think you can draw a line from Clint to George Strait to George Jones to Lefty Frizzell to Hank Williams. I've got goosebumps, you know, just just thinking about that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know the. Uh, the significance of us doing this song. Yeah, together, you really. know. Isn't that something Knowing that, that, where that comes Times from. they are changing, I think. You got me where you want me. going to go all the way through. This is just to set Gladys' level and check the tempo. Oh, no, was this, this project gave me a great excuse to work with two people I've been dying to work with. You know, Gladys Knight, obviously. I, I come from Detroit. Uh, you know, it's, this, is, this is 30 years of wanting to work with Gladys Knight. So glad we got the real thing. I personally find it much harder to cover a song like Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing, which is a perfect record. Well, all we had was the hook, though. And then it was, like, strange because when he came up with the verse, I said, it's kind of like poet poetry, you know? It's kind of, you know, your picture on the wall, I can't see you'll come to me. It's, it's kind of poetic. Is this down enough? Well, Ashford and Simpson ain't nothing like the real thing. And, and Motown, in general, really represents kind of the, the other complete end of the spectrum from Stax and Southern Soul. Ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. Yeah. Ain't nothing like the real thing. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Vince Gladys, the intro will be exactly the same as the record. It's like two bars and then in. One bar of drums and then da-da-da-da-da. Vince is the guy who is, uh, I mean, he is returning the, the, the tenor singer to the heartthrob status within, within country music. You would think that R&B music and, and the perception of country music being a redneck music and so on and so forth, that they would be like that. at opposite ends of the spectrum, but I see them like... Just like that. Right there. I really do. He's leaving, leaving. A lot of people don't know that the original title to Midnight Train to Georgia. Midnight Plane Midnight to Houston. Plane to Houston. <laughs> yeah. 
I said, I do not know too much about Houston, and I <laughs> sure don't like to fly. <laughs> By the end, it became clear that there was this fabric of uh, shared human experience. I suppose it's the humanistic message of the record, that, that beneath skin color, what you're dealing with is human emotion. I've never heard a story told like country people tell a story musically. It is so raw and so basic, everybody can understand it. So glad we got the real thing, baby. So glad we got the real thing. I, I love the emotion and the soul, you know, and that comes in country music and R&B music both. I think country music is great. It's doing great right now. But I think we got too much up stuff. We got too much uh, uh, happy stuff. I think the feeling needs to really get back, like rhythm and blues, and and uh, and, and needs to get back to basics. Blues has no color. Blues is that feeling that distorts your mind or rip your insides out. Yesterday 